Hey there, good morning, a fresh new day, chemistry team, it's your chemistry coach coming at you. We are ready to roar into video number three for our solids and solubility uh, chapter for us. Again, that is chapter 18. So we looked uh, at an overview of what a saturated solution is versus supersaturated, unsaturated, those kinds of things. Um, We've looked so qualitatively at the solubility of a solid, and then we looked quantitatively at it. So we've looked at problems on how to solve for KSP given a solubility. We looked at how to solve for the solubility given the KSP. Now what we're going to do is look at how we can impact that solubility, right? Add a, does it have acid-base behavior? Can we impact things with a complex ion formation? which we looked a little bit in the complex ion chapter, so a little bit of review in this one. But I want to start with the common ion effect. We looked at that for acids and bases back in chapter 16, uh, at, that if we add a common ion, that's going to shift the equilibrium away from that common ion, common ion being something in the equilibrium equation. We'll do the exact same thing. We found with acids and bases, it reduced their ionization. Uh, and then I introduced it to you in that same one. So if you want to go back to the common ion effect video, I would recommend watching that before you watch this video uh, to get the basic idea of the common effect, the common ion effect. And we saw in that video that adding a common ion to a solid um, in equilibrium with its solution, that it would reduce its solubility. So let's look at that again real quick with a, a problem here. This is a qualitative one. The way it's phrased, we actually don't have to calculate anything. We can just say, hey, it's going to increase or decrease the solubility or have no effect. And then I'll pause it, and then I'll put another problem up on the board. We'll actually calculate how much of a change in solubility there is uh, versus a solid just in pure water versus if we add a common ion to it. All right, so let's say... We've got this question, how would adding 13 and a half milliliters of a 0.15 molar sodium phosphate solution affect the solubility of solid calcium phosphate? All right, even though we got numbers here, this is a qualitative question, it's just saying how is it? It's not asking how much it did, just how. Is it gonna increase or decrease it? If you're stuck on a test, start with the equilibrium equation, right? So let's draw that. So we've got calcium phosphate, so let's draw that solid. So calcium phosphate has three calcium ions for every two phosphate ions. Those will dissolve, right? Dissociate, which will end up being reversible. So let's, we got a subscript of three for the calcium. So that becomes a coefficient of three over on the product side. So we're gonna get three moles of calcium ions in solution for every one mole of calcium phosphate solid that's dissolving. And then we got a subscript of two outside the parentheses on the phosphate. So we're going to get two moles of phosphate ions on the product side. So let's add that. So two moles of phosphate ions. You want to get real good at that. And for this problem, we don't need to look up the KSP value. We're not quantitatively calculating anything. What are we adding? We are adding sodium phosphate. All right, so what we want to do is look at what is in that sodium phosphate solution. Are there any calcium ions in that? Or are there any phosphate ions in that? I always look for that common ion first. Am I adding a solution that has an ion in common with this equilibrium equation? If I do, it's going to increase that and it'll shift away from it. Right? Um, and if I don't see a common ion, I'll look for possible acid-base reactions. I'll look for possible complex ion formation. If it's a high enough concentration, four molar or higher. Uh, I'll look for possible secondary precipitation reaction. You gotta, you know, think about all these kinds of things, right? So we're adding, and you could probably do this in your head, we're adding sodium phosphate aqueous. Right? So let's draw that. Now that's a sodium salt, so that's 100% soluble, right? So sodium phosphate will 100% go to one mole of sodium phosphate will give us three moles of sodium ions plus one mole of phosphate ions. And if this is 0.15 molar, then the sodium would be three times 0.15 molar, and the phosphate would be 0.15 molar. Right? We don't need the molarities for this problem, again, because it's qualitative. But can you see the common ion? 
You can see that there's a phosphate ion in the equilibrium equation for the solid. You can see that there's a phosphate ion that we're adding. So this is the common ion. Therefore, it it's in common with the equilibrium equation. So this is a common ion effect problem, which we could you know, qu quantitatively do, but that's not the point right here. So what's going to happen, adding that common ion is going to increase the concentration of the phosphate ion. So that was in a happy equilibrium state, and all of a sudden, ah, red alert, red alert, we've got too much phosphate, everybody, we've got an emergency, too much phosphate, somebody dumps some sodium phosphate in here, we don't care about the sodium ions, but the phosphate ions have messed up our equilibrium, we want to go back to our equilibrium state. So Le Chatelier's principle, remember the French person, if we increase something, it's going to counteract it by shifting away from it. So this is going to shift left to bring as best as it can the phosphate back down. In the process, right, the solid will dissolve less. So you're going to shoot this way and the solubility will decrease in that process. So the solubility will decrease. That's the net, and we talked about that in the common ion effect video too. So, but overall, adding a common ion, whether it's calcium ions or phosphate ions, right, doesn't matter, both, boom, shifts to the left. Thank you, Le Chatelier. Solubility goes down, and let's actually calculate that in the next one. So what I want you to do is look at the last video where we calculated the solubility of bis, the BII3, this is the 3-iodide. I think I have that right here. So we got, I think... Uh, 7.7 .7 times 10 to the minus third grams per liter for the BII3 solid, bismuth 3 iodide. What I wanted, that was in pure water. And I'll write that up on the next board. So what we'll do is we'll add something that contains either the bismuth 3 ion or the iodide ion and see how that impacts its solubility and compare it to the prior number. Hoo -hoo! But I can ask you qualitative questions on quizzes and exams like this. Um, and I could also quantify them and have you calculate solubility changes. Let's do that. You guys ready for this? If you watch that last video, it's going to be identical to the problem we did with the uh, bismuth 3 iodide in pure water. We're just adding an extra little tidbit to it. So let's say, what's the solubility of this bismuth 3 iodide in a 0 0.050 molar solution of bismuth 3 nitrate? Right? So first thing I'm going to do is look at, obviously I'm going to have this solid equilibrium, but I'm going to look at what I'm adding, this bismuth 3 nitrate. Seeing that's a nitrate solution that's 100% soluble, so let's look at what we're adding to it and whether there's a common ion in present with the equilibrium uh, equation for that solid. Let's take a look. So bismuth 3 nitrate, so we're, uh, let's take our bismuth 3 nitrate, and that's a solution. That's 100% soluble because of the nitrate. That's why you can't find a KSP value for that. All right. So we're going to go one bismuth, what? One mole of bismuth 3 nitrate will produce one mole of the bismuth 3 ion in solution. Plus, we've got three moles of nitrate for one mole of bismuth 3 nitrate. So we're going to go the three nitrates there. Let's look at the concentrations provided. This was a 0 0.050 molar solution of the bismuth 3 nitrate. Since this is a 1 to 1 ratio, I'm going to get 0 0.050 molar bismuth 3 ion in solution. That's what's in. So let's say I got a test tube of that or a beaker of that, and I'm going to add it to a solution that's saturated with that solid. And let's see what happens. Uh, the nitrate will be three times that, so it'll be three times 0 0.050 molar, which will not be important because that's not going to be a common ion. All right, now let's take a look at our solid. Let's look at our equilibrium. So this is what we're in. Let's look at our equilibrium. We've got the solid. So let's draw the equilibrium for the solid. So we're just kind of qualitatively looking at the question first, and then we'll go, okay, now I understand what's happening. You really got to recognize, am I just in pure water? 
am I in something that's not pure water, right? Or if I'm, am I in pure water, am I adding something, right? Is this a common ion effect? Is this an acid-base problem? Is this, uh, you know, dissolving a solid to form a complex ion problem? All this stuff. We have to think about potential reactions. All right, bismuth 3 iodine will dissociate to give us one mole of bismuth 3 ion and three moles of the iodide ion. First thing you look for before you look for reactions is common ion. You see the bismuth 3 ion that we're adding and the bismuth 3 ion that's in the equation. The nitrate ion is not going to do anything. It's not going to react with iodide. They're both negative. Nitrate can't form a precipitate, right? So I'm not worried about that. So I'm not worried about any side reactions going on here. Nitrate's not you know, acidic or basic or anything like that. But I do have the common ion. See that? Boop! It's the first. Whoa! I just checked my pen. Don't tell my wife. I just put a green dot on the carpet. <sighs> it's on video. Oi! All right, anyway. Uh, we got the common ion. That's the first thing I look for. <laughs> All we got to do now is set up our ice table exactly like we did in the, on the regular problem. But in the last problem, in pure water, we are initial, right? Let's do our ICE. So let's put that in, uh, in green here. Let's do an ice table real quick. ICE. We don't have to worry about the bismuth 3 nitrate. I mean, the iodide, dirt, bismuth 3 iodide. Now, in the last problem, we assumed in pure water that you're starting with just solid and zero this and zero this initially. Oh, I made that a little too ugly. There's three rows for a nice table, not two. We put a zero here for the bismuth 3 ion. And we put a zero here for the iodide ion because we were in pure water. So we're starting with none of that. And then we formed X of this, 3X of that. And at equilibrium, we had X of the bismuth and 3X of the iodide. And then we plugged it, plugged in the KSP value, solve for X, and then multiplied by the molar mass to get the solubility. But we're not starting with zero bismuth, are we? We're in a bismuth 3 nitrate solution. Whoa, that changes things. So we are starting with... 0 0.050 molar bismuth 3 ion. Not zero. That's the difference between this problem and the last problem. This is all you do for a common ion effect problem. You just put a non-zero number there for the common ion. What a bing, what a boom, right? But watch out here because sometimes you got to multiply by the coefficient. We didn't have to here. It's one times that, but sometimes that'll happen. And we're starting with no iodide, right? We didn't add any iodide to this. So at equilibrium, the change, if one mole of this dissolves, I'm going to form X of that and 3X of that, right? Because there's a 3 in front of it. I get 3 times as much iodide after it dissociates than I do the bismuth ions. So at equilibrium, I'm going to have the initial plus the change. So I'm going to take the initial 0 0.050 molar I had in the solution, right? The original solution I had. Plus, I'm going to get whatever bismuth ion I get from the solid dissolving, which is going to be a pretty tiny amount, right? Because this is a common ion. It's going to be dissolving less than normal. 0 plus 3x is 3x. That doesn't change from what we did in the last problem. So the only difference between here and the last problem is that was just x in the last problem. Let's set up the equilibrium expression. Let's, uh, and we know what KSP is, right? Solve for X. We're going to, this is going to be a type three equilibrium problem. Pause it. See if you can do that for me. Set up the equilibrium expression. We're going to be assuming X is really small. So you're going to have to test that assumption, making sure that that creates less than 5% error. Um, so you could take the molarity divided by the KSP. If that's greater than hundred, that's good. Or just solve for X and take X divided by 0 0.050. Uh, I think I'll do it that way and see if we get uh, less than 5% error. So I'm going to pause this, set up a new board, uh, and see if you can get the answer before I did. Go! Did you do it? Did you do it? Let's see if you get what I got. Let's go through the same process. This is a type 3 equilibrium problem. Step 1, right? Do Q versus K, see which, which way it shifts. Step 2, set up your equilibrium expression, you know, your ice table equilibrium expression, yada, yada, yada. 
I think I forgot to do Q versus K, didn't I? Oh, oh my goodness. So if you look back at that, my apologies. Q has to be zero, right? Because we had no iodide. So it has to shift right. That's why I did the plus X and the plus three X. Oh my goodness, my apologies. Happens to the best of us, right? So step one, Q versus K. Q is less than K, shifts to the right. Step two, ice table. Uh, and I drew the uh, expression back up, but I didn't do the ice table on there because you got it on your nose. So let's set up our K values. So KSP is going to be, if you look on the equilibrium table, uh, it's going to be the bismuth 3 ion times the iodide ion cubed. There's nothing in the denominator, which is nice because that's a solid. I don't have to worry about that. If you were doing activities, that would be a value of one, right? Solids and liquids have an activity of one, but we're not doing activities. Blah, blah. All right. On our table, bismuth was 0 0.050 plus X, right? Because we had the initial 0 0.050 molar from the bismuth 3 nitrate solution plus X, whatever we get from the solid dissolving to a little tiny extent, right? Iodide was 3x, right? So that'll be 3x cubed. Don't forget you're cubing the 3 as well as the x. And that's going to be equal to the Ksp value, which we can get from, I don't think that was on our table, so I had to give that one to you, which was I think 7.7, .7, what do I have, times 10 to the minus 19? This is gonna force us into some gnarly, gnarly stuff solving for X. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make an assumption, right? Type three problem, that X is tiny. Let's assume X is tiny. So this would be approximately, so 0 0.050 plus X, and X is really small, that would just be approximately 0 0.050. So let's go 0 0.050, and three X cubed, three cubed is three times three times nine times three is 27 x to the cube, so that'd be 27 x cubed, 27 x cubed, right tab? Let's test that, let's solve for x, take x divided by 0 0.050, right, that divided by that, times that by 100 and see if that's less than 5%. So let's solve for x. So x will be equal to, let's take, let's take the Ksp value, which you'll either find on your table or is provided. This I have to give you 7.7 .7 times 10 to the minus 19. That's our KSP. I need to divide that by 0 0.050 and the 27. And then I need to take the cubed root of that whole thing. So I need to take all of this You can either do the cubed root or just go to the one-third power. Either way, it doesn't really matter. So this 27 is an exact number. The 0 0.050 is good to two sig figs. The 7.7 .7 is good to two sig figs. All right, so when I punch this out, I get 8.304, good to two significant digits, times 10 to the negative seventh. Negative seventh molar, all right? That's X. Let's test that assumption. Right? So let's test the assumption. And again, there's two ways you could do this. I, I jump and forth between the two ways. It doesn't really matter. But let's take X divided by, as X, divided by the initial concentration of the bismuth ion times 100, right? So is that X really tiny? Is the amount coming from the solid X so tiny? How tiny is it? It's so tiny compared to the amount that we started with from the bismuth three nitrate solution that the amount produced by the solid is just irrelevant. It's just irrelevant. So we can just ignore it and get less than 5% there. So let's plug in X, which is 8.3. 0, 4 times 10 to the minus 7th molar divided by the initial amount, which was 0 0.050 molar. Let's times that by 100. All right, the 100 is exact, so we're good to two significant figures. 
I get a really small number. Oh my goodness, 0 0.0016. <laughs> There's my two sig figs, 0 0.0016, uh, six zero. percent. I've run out of room, so let me draw that below. 0 0.0016. I need a bigger board. Six zero percent. Would you agree with me that's less than five percent? That makes our assumption valid. We are perfectly valid in assuming 0 0.050 plus x is just 0 0.050. I mean, that's an insignificant percent error. Insignificant and tiny. Nice. All right. So all we have to do is take x and then figure out what the solubility is. Because remember, x is the solubility of the solid. That's the bismuth ion concentration that comes from the solid. So let's just take that value of x exactly like we did in the last problem. That would be the molarity, the molar solubility, that would be the molarity of the bismuth 3 ion x from the solid. And then convert that to moles of the solid and then multiply by the molar mass of the solid. I'll do that on the next board. I, don't, I might be able to fit that on here. Let's give that a shot. Let's take this value of x and get the solubility. Uh, so x was 8.304. Ah, this isn't going to fit on the board. I'll do it on the next board. So write that value of x down. I'm going to pop this off and then do our last calculation where we have some more space. So much nicer. We've got some space. All right. So I just reiterated that we solve for x, right? The amount of bismuth ion produced from the solid dissolving in a bismuth 3 nitrate solution of 0 0.050 molar. That's a different value of x that we got in pure water, right? This is a lot smaller. That represents the bismuth 3 ion concentration. So I'm going to write that as 8.304 times 10 to minus 7 moles of bismuth 3 ion per liter solution, good to two significant figures. We want the solubility, that would be grams of the solid per liter of solution. So let's convert the bismuth 3 ion. So we want to look at moles of bismuth 3 to moles of the solid. <coughs> can you see it's a one-to-one -one ratio there? All right. You can look back on your equilibrium equation as well, and one mole of bismuth 3 iodide solid produced one mole of bismuth 3 ion. That's why it was X and not 3X like the I minus. That allows us to cancel that out. So the moles of bismuth 3 ion go. Now I've got moles of bismuth. This, this would give us the molar solubility of the solid. But I didn't ask for the molar solubility. I asked for the solubility. Let's multiply that by the molar mass. So for every mole of bismuth 3 iodide, we want to know how many grams there are. And we did that in the prior problem. So I'm just going to write that number back up. Just look at your periodic table. Take the iodine times 3. Add one of the bismuth to it, limited by decimal places. All right, so I got 589, right? If you look at the last problem, 589, that's a big number. 589.69381. That was good to four decimal places. 6938.10. Grams of bismuth 3 iodide. Right, so that allows us to cancel out moles. That will give us grams of bismuth 3 iodide per liter of solution. That would be the solubility, right? Two significant figures. This is exact. That's a lot more than two, so forget about that. We're good to two significant figures. Right. So pop that out for me real quick. All right. And what I want you to do is look at the prior video, find what the solubility was of bismuth 3 iodide in pure water. Now let's compare these. Remember, we predicted the solubility to go down with the presence of the common ion. Let's see if the math bears out. So go in the prior video, look at the answer we had for bismuth 3 iodide in pure water. I'll wait for you. All right, did you do your due diligence and look it up? All right, so 
Multiply the molar mass times your value of x, the bismuth ion from the solid. I got 4.896 times 10 to the minus fourth grams per liter. Good to two significant figures. So that's going to round up to 4.9 times 10 to the minus fourth grams per liter. That's what I asked for. Let's compare that to the prior problem where we did the solubility in pure water. So in pure water, the solubility of the bismuth 3 iodide was 7.7 .7 times 10 to the minus third grams per liter. And I'm missing my negative one there. It's not grams times liters, it's grams per liter. Look at what happened when we did it with the presence of this common ion. It dropped by over an order of magnitude. It's over 10 times less soluble if you had that solid in a uh, 0 0.050 molar solution with its common ion, the bismuth 3 nitrate. Shifts it to the left, correct? Boom, you add that common ion, it shifts back the other way by a distinctly obvious quantitative amount. So that's how we conquer it. And the only difference is instead of putting X, you put the initial amount plus X and you do the exact same problem. Sweet. All right. So now we're going to look at things like, you know, acid base behavior, complex ions, dissolving solids. We're going to look at completeness of precipitation. If I add two solutions, do I actually get it? Can you predict whether a precipitate is going to happen? It turns out there's a minimum concentration of these species you need. Let's get into that good juicy stuff.